Welcome back. We took well, one week off. We are on April 27th. We've had Pesach, Passover. We've had Resurrection Day. We've had a lot to celebrate. I trust that you had a beautiful time seeing our Messiah, our Savior, in the, the roles of glory that he is part of, that out of even his death came for us the victory of eternal life. But it's good to be back to class. It is uh, this Wednesday afternoon, April 27th. Did I say that? I may be saying it a second time, but anyway, we've got, we're have got we on the same page now. And we're picking up just before we go back into Genesis chapter 4, and we'll probably pick up at uh, about verse 3. Yeah, I was kind of fooling with where we'll start, but somewhere around in there. But just before we do... Um, toward the end of our last class, we talked about the fact that if they broke one law, they were guilty of it all. We were looking for the verse where it says that. We came up with Davarim, Deuteronomy 27, 26, which says, Cursed be the man that obeys not the words of this covenant. And we know that, like, like Viagra, Leviticus 19.37 says, Observe all my statutes, my ordinances. We know that the scripture said that we were to keep all the commandments. But the verse that I was looking for, and I want to read it to you, and that's why I opened up my other tab, which is now stuck again. It'll come. Okay, it didn't complete the cycle. It's actually, the reason why I couldn't think is, I was expecting it to be in the original covenant, but it's in our Brit Hadashah, our new covenant, all the way to the book of James. So take a quick peek with me. Don't lose Genesis, but to answer our question, it is James chapter 2 and verse 10 that I was fighting for. And if you say, but wait a minute, that's all the way in the, in the New Testament, and it's almost at the end, then you're thinking wrong. That's true, but that's not, we don't place things in that way. That's why we don't even call it Old Testament because that sounds old and antiquated and it's not. Why we call it the original covenant because it's what God originally began with to bring to man's attention. And he didn't originally begin all the way from Garden of Eden, obviously, but when he brought law, it was to show man that he cannot live a perfect life. It was to show that he falls short. That law, we, we can't ever say that we're out from under the law. We're out from under the condemnation of the law. But does anyone want to live in a lawless environment? I'll put it this way. If there's no laws for the streets, I don't want to go drive. If we don't have red lights and green lights and if we don't have speed limits, can you imagine the catastrophes that would be constant? Those laws are there for a good reason and they're a guide that's needed and if you break the law, there's a consequence for it. Well, that's a small snapshot of the bigger picture and in James 2.10 we do read and he's referring, remember, remember James is Jewish, he's writing with what's in mind is his Jewish background. He, in his book, really brings out a bit of law and a bit of grace. And you have to understand where he's coming from because grace was all new at this time to them. For us, we've lived with it for many years since. But he's bringing out now from the law viewpoint, for whoever, verse 10, keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of it all. That's the verse that I was looking for when we were talking about it last time. And I went to find a way to help you understand. And I think one of the best ways was someone likened it to a chain. If you have a chain that has all these links, your chain is good, but if one of those links breaks, it's not good. The chain is broken. I'll give you a good example. I'm a child, I took my beloved puppy dog with me down to my aunt's house in San Diego. They wanted me to come into the house and leave the dog on a very long chain that was secured into the ground. There was water there, it was shaded, and it was like, he'll be okay for a few minutes, come on in, in probably to eat or something, I don't remember what. But all I had in my mind was, if one link of that chain breaks, it's not going to keep my dog safe. And I was very insecure with leaving my dog. 
I think the Lord was putting a check mark in me. And especially because we're in San Diego. I live in San Bernardino. My dog doesn't know the area. He's not going to come back home. And he's going to go want to explore just, just because he's curious. And sure enough, I went to check on him just a couple minutes after being in. And the chain had broken. And he was gone. And thankfully, because he hadn't had time to go far at all, we were able to find him very quickly. I was so relieved and nobody made me separate from my doggy the rest of the day. My <laughs> 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 family didn't mean to be ornery, but it shows me this example really hits home with me. It was just one link that broke, but it violated the whole. If you break one part of the law, you're guilty as if you've broken it all. It doesn't mean that you went and broke every single link, but you broke the chain. You broke what God said. You have to live at this level or you're guilty. So the same way that you may break the speed limit and you'll pay a ticket for the speed limit, but I could say you broke the driving laws. It doesn't mean you broke every law, but you broke it in general. So the idea behind it is anything short of that perfection, you're guilty. And that's what it was meant to show. Now, it could be this is even why in when the Lord was working a new way, grace had come in. We're talking about Acts chapter 15, and the council is trying to decide, what do we do with the Gentiles? And the point of contention is there were those who wanted to make the Gentiles come under the law and keep the law. And there were those that, that like Paul, who God was raising up, who were saying, we couldn't keep it. Why do you want to put them on a bur under a burden that we couldn't even keep? And they finally decided there were certain points that were just too, uh, the Jewish people just couldn't cross over and accept them being involved in eating things strangled, in, in things that have blood, in fornication, and I forget the fourth, it should be in my mind, I know all four, but anyway, that's not my point. But they tried to say then, oh, but they have to be circumcised. They, you know, it was as if you, you, they were still thinking you have to do the whole law or it, it's all null and void. They probably were getting it because that's the way they're being taught. You either keep it all or you're guilty of it all. But under grace, we know that we're, re, we're removed from the condemnation of the law, and that's the difference. It doesn't mean that, oh, now you can go murder, now you can go covet, now you can commit adultery, now you can, you know, all these different things that we know that's still wrong on God's holy standard. But we're forgiven for our sins, past, present, future, yet Paul um, quickly came to the point, I think it's Romans 9, where he says, does that mean that we can go do anything we want? It doesn't matter because we're forgiven, and it's, it's God forbid, may it never be. Anathema, don't even think that way. So, uh, it's not a freedom to go act, but it does mean you won't stand before the judge one day and have the judge say, you are guilty. No, you, your guilt has been removed in the blood of the Lamb of God who, who put his sinless blood to pay your penalty. And so you're freed from that. Yes, Rhonda. So the, the reason why I was inquiring on that is because if we're talking to a Jewish person, they're, they're not really embracing the New Testament. Right. So we want to point them to the Old Testament. And when you point them to that uh, scripture Deuteronomy, or I think you said Deuteronomy 27, 26. Yes. How, how do they handle that if uh, they don't have, uh, they can't do sacrifices? How do they handle that? They have put in substitutes. They substitute prayer. They substitute um, the, the ultra-religious at Yom Kippur will, through a ceremony, um, okay, I have to explain because I don't know how else to say it. It's called swinging Kippurah. Kippurah, Kippur is the atonement. They take a chicken and they swing it above their head and they say, may their sins be, be placed on this chicken who will mercifully be put to death in their stead. So they substitute it. They substitute saying certain prayers, having extra services. And that, that's for those who try to come up with an answer. Um, there are plenty who just, well, you know, we can only do what we can do, and they just, they ignore it. But those who try will 
come up with other things in its place. Our response. So they don't point to a Bible. They don't point to a Old Testament scripture. No, because there, okay. there isn't, and even what they're trying to do, and that's what we would say, well, where does God say we can substitute a chicken and that we can make that sacrifice apart from the temple? Because God said it's a lamb or a goat, you know, depending on which sacrifice, which date we're talking about, but it's to be done at the temple. It's to be done where sacrifices were to be done, at the altar at the temple. Uh, tabernacle before that so we bring them back to the Word of God and we say where does God say you can substitute prayer you know they'll they'll point to different things they'll use well like Daniel he uh, he prayed because he was in a foreign land he couldn't do so he he prayed instead well it's true he prayed but where is the scripture that says God says okay Daniel you're okay because you're praying now I, I have a different requirement we never find a, a verse in scripture that gives an excuse and that's why I asked that question, and I forgot to follow through on Saturday, but are all Jews condemned since 70 AD? Because that's the last time a sacrifice could be made at the temple, because the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, there, and it hasn't been rebuilt to this date. So are all Jews condemned? Because God says there has to be the sacrificial blood placed on the altar at the temple. And, of course, the answer is no. God hasn't condemned them all. I believe even let the temple be destroyed, one reason, I mean, obviously it was the, the Jewish people were being scattered because they were the, living idolatrously apart from their God. But I think God was trying to draw the attention for those who, who are coming to faith to realize it's not in the sacrifices anymore. It's in the sacrifice, the Lamb of God, who gave his sinless blood on the mercy seat forever. That there doesn't need to be the continual. There doesn't need to be a new high priest now. You have one eternal high priest. It's Yeshua Jesus after the order of Melchizedek. My God is righteous. My God is king. Because that order, we don't see a beginning and an end. It's a continuous. And so God, I think, was making it very clear to our people, you don't need the temple now to make your sacrifices. That's been taken care of for you. You have to simply come in faith, believing that God fulfilled his word where he said he would put the blood on the altar for the forgiveness of sin. So we draw them back to the scriptures and we show them that God did make a way for them. The way is the one who called himself the way. I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. And so we just draw them back to that. Um, because we have to show them from scripture if they broke the law, they were under the penalty of the law. Now there, it's impossible for the law to save them. The law has condemned them now. And that's what we have to show them. No matter how many good acts they do, no matter if they are obedient to every other commandment, they're still under the penalty of breaking that law. They didn't keep it perfectly. And so because they transgressed, there has to be a judgment. There has to be a penalty for that violation. Um, so many want, and, and in, in that, our, our beloved Gentiles too, but so many Jewish people want to say, if I live a good life, if I do good mitzvah, good deeds, God will let me in. Well, the question is always going to be, when would you know you've done enough? And who gets to say that? Where do you get to judge that? But I'm going to also say, let's say that somebody stole a horse, okay? They're in court now, they're in trouble because they got caught with your horse in, on their property. They stole that horse. Oh, but judge, this man is such a good man. He fed this family when they were starving to death. He gave money to these people when they were down and out. And, and they start giving this whole laundry list of all the good deeds this man has done. Let's say he's done a thousand good deeds. Oh, but wait a minute. He stole the horse. <laughs> How does this wipe out that? He has to give the horse back. He has to pay a penalty for taking the horse. That's what we're trying to show. One transgression was enough to bring them under the, the penalty of the law, which if you broke the law, the penalty is, is death because breaking the law is sin. The penalty of sin is death. So there is no other excuse. There's no other way that they can slice it or dice it. There are no scriptures that give 
oh, but okay, do do your your number of good deeds, and and we'll let the right, you know, we'll weigh it in the balances. Where do you see God say, I'll weigh your actions in the balance and decide whether you get to go into heaven or not? There's no scripture that ever gives that to you. Um, so I think I've covered it. I'm looking. I don't see anything more I want to say. Does that does that help you, Rhonda, especially with who you're wanting to share it with? Because I know you have Jewish people in your life. So, okay? Okay. Good. Okay. Very good question. Very good even apart from the Jewish people because we're all, Jew or Gentile, guilty of not living perfectly. And God says, if you don't live a perfect life, I can't let you into heaven. Can you imagine heaven if he did? Oh, well, we'll just overlook <coughs> the fact he stole the horse because he did so many other good things. And we'll just overlook the fact that this one, well, let's take it right to today's lesson. This one got so angry, he killed somebody. Oh, but that was just a momentary, you know, he ate too many Twinkies. So we'll overlook that. That's not his person. Well, let's see if God overlooked the first murder. Let's see how how he took that. So let's go ahead and get back into uh, Bear Sheet, into Genesis chapter 4. And because we've been gone for two weeks, let me just bring back to your mind that we've gotten to the point where they're living outside of the Garden of Eden. We have Adam and Ahava, Adam and Eve. We have that they've given birth, firstborn Cain, Cain, secondborn Aval, Abel. And we have that the two, and time has passed, we're going to see uh, very quickly that it's enough time that they easily could have had children and grandchildren by the time our story is taking place. We'll see that as we go on through. And when I call it a story, it is a true story. The only time that we have stories in scripture that were not actual facts, they were called parables and they never gave people's real names. It would be just like when we use an analogy. But other than that, and even that, there's nothing false in that. So, you know, just I want to be careful how I use my words because somebody might say, oh, she's saying the Bible is only a story. No, it's a true story. So we have that um, these two are adults in their, their lives now uh, because they both have occupations. In verse 2, we have the Abel of all was a keeper of flocks that's talking about sheep. He was a sheep herder, he was a shepherd, okay? And we have that Kion, his older brother, Cain was a tiller of the ground. He worked with gardening. He worked with trees and, and um, vegetables and all of that. So both of them, they're, they're good occupations. The sheep are going to be wool to clothe them and keep them warm and uh, we have um, the vegetables that are good for the body to eat. We're not saying that, that either occupation was not good. Both occupations were fine. But we see as we read our story, God had um, obviously stipulated what was to be accepted as a sacrifice to him. And he's already put into motion, we see when he clothed Adam and Eve, that there had to have been an animal slain to clothe them and that it was the first picture already of blood that would be shed of the innocent to cover the sins of the guilty. And we know they would be covered until Messiah's blood was put on the mercy seat. Now they could be washed away because it was sinless, perfect blood. So we see this has been being taught. We're getting the whole picture as we continue to read, but obviously from our story, we're going to see that they knew what they were supposed to bring and they were supposed to be bringing a sacrifice. Don't forget also, because it'll tie into today, that we believe that we saw when um, Adam and Eve were taken out of the garden and God put the cherry beam there with the flaming sword, that there's hint in the words that there may have been right there an altar. That may be the place where they were to bring the sacrifice. The flaming fiery sword shows the fire of judgment that was keeping them from going into the garden, eating from the tree of life, and living forever in their sinful state. Hallelujah. I don't want to live in this body and this world forever. I want the perfect body. And I heard my mom say so many times, I can't wait till I get my new body. <laughs> and I want to live in the perfect environment of heaven, not in a sinful world where 
murder and the rest takes place. So there were obviously guidelines we're going to see. Um, verse 3, it came about in the course of time that, and I'll just say it in English, Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. Okay? Abel, on his part, also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of their fat portions. Okay, it could sound good on the surface. Oh, they're both bringing the best of what they have, what's, what they're raising. They're bringing the best and they're bringing it to the Lord. But we're going to see there's a problem. So obviously that's not our whole story. When we see that, that Abel brought the firstlings of his flock in their fat portions, it says, and the Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering. Okay, that means the Lord was accepting of it, that what Abel, Abel brought was accepted by the Lord. But, verse 5, let me make sure I've told you everything. Oh, 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 before I go into verse 5, um, let me bring out, okay, let me back up just slightly. What I want us to see is it's on the basis of the offerings that we're going to see the differences. It's not that God said, I love one more than the other. It's not that God favored one son over the other. It's that God is looking at their, their offerings and saying, one is, in my word, kosher, <laughs> one isn't, okay? God was accepting of one and not of the other. Now, obviously, if Abel is bringing a lamb, we understand their sacrifice there. We understand that that animal lost its life. Cain's bringing fruit from the ground. There's not going to be any shedding of blood. There's not going to be any death that's taking place here. We know as we go on down through scripture, it's already been stipulated and started, but as we go through scripture, we know from Leviticus, there had to be blood put on the altar for the atonement. We know that you get all the way into the New Covenant, into the New Testament, and you have uh, Yohanan John say about Yeshua Jesus, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And we know that that's exactly what Jesus did. He gave his life that the world could receive forgiveness. We see in Hebrews 11.4, and, and we'll go back and forth to that verse, so you might want to mark it if you're one that likes to look it up. If not, I'll be reading it to you. But we see in Hebrews 11, that God makes it very clear. Verse 4, by faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain. Okay, Cain's is not considered good, not considered better. And as Abel did that, it says, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous. God testifying about his gifts and through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. Is Hebrews 11, 4, is that your question, Maria, or not? No, okay, can you unmute yourself? Perfect. I know what you were saying uh, that, that there is nothing, this we're, we're talking of the very beginning, you know, obviously uh, Genesis, and the only sacrifice that we might be able to see is when, when uh, um, you know, God um, uh, or, or Adam and Eve actually were disobedient. Right. And he had to, in order for, for, for them to have uh, um, uh, coverings for their, for their nakedness. Yes. And he did a given covering, covering uh, of animals. But prior to that, or even from that time, is the only time, nothing else, because I know you're mentioning Leviticus, but Leviticus was after. Right. If I didn't make that clear, absolutely our first... Uh, animal losing its life, the innocent animal losing its life, the first time would be when God clothed Adam and Eve, not anything prior to that. So Now, do you think that, that from there they should have known that it had to be a sacrifice, that the, the sacrifice that they were bringing, what, was that a sacrifice or was that an offering? What they were bringing? That's what's a little bit confusing, you know, because like you said, uh, for forgiveness of sins, uh, uh, without the blood, we cannot forgive it, obviously, obviously, the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, uh, uh, Abel was able to bring a, an offering that, that the blood will be shed. Right. But Cain did not. Right. And that's well, what we're going to go into. And that's what I think is kind of confusing because did Cain knew? 
Okay, let's look at that. You're just a little ahead, but I did address oh. that as a question. Did Cain know? Did he know what was required? What are we seeing? How do we know how, you know, why God is judging? Let me show you one thing before we go into answering those questions because verse 5, which I almost started, will give answers starting right there. But let me show you that um, fire falling from heaven on Abel's sacrifice, and, and we take for granted that because we don't read it, but we understand the sacrifice happened, that we see that as a pattern in Scripture. Let me show you. If we go to Leviticus 9, and this does come after, but it shows the pattern. Levit Leviticus, Viacra, um, 9, 23. Maybe I can just start with 20. Yeah, let's start with 23. 23 and 24. Moshe and Aharon, Moses and Aaron, went into the tent of the meeting. The tent of the meeting um, is where they met with God. It's the beginning of what we will call eventually the tabernacle. They went to the tent of the meeting. When they came out and they blessed the people, the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. So Moshe and Aaron, as representatives of all the people, have gone into the place where they meet the Lord, and the glory of the Lord is appearing to all the people. So in <coughs> essence, God is showing that he was pleased with Moshe and Aharon coming to God for themselves, for the people, and he shows that by his glory being seen by all, and verse 24, then fire came out from before the Lord, and consumed the burnt offering and the portions of fat on the altar. <coughs> Remember we read that Aval had brought the firstling of his flock and of the fat. He brought the fat also. Um, when all the people saw it, they shouted and they fell on their faces. And I think that was a shout for joy. Hallelujah, it's been accepted by God. And then realizing they're in the presence of holy God, they fall on their face in uh, humbleness you know, before their God. Let me give you a few more examples so you see, because Scripture helps us understand Scripture. And uh, we, we don't want to be coming up with our own ideas. We want to see what Scripture can help us see. So now we'll go to Judges chapter 6. And in Judges chapter 6 and verse 21, oh, I went, it didn't take Judges. Let me get that in there and try again. It went to Jude. I tried to shortcut. Okay, Judges chapter 6 and verse 21. We're now in the time of Gideon. Gideon, he was, okay, in the very beginning, he's this great, mighty man. He's brave and he's powerful and he's strong and he's huge and no one's going to mess with him, right? <laughs> if you know your Bible, you're all going, ah. Oh. Ah, in the beginning, he's hiding down below in like a, a pit area, trying to do his winnowing where you need to be up high so that the wind can take the chaff away and leave what's good. But he's doing it down below, lest the enemy around see. He's in fear of his life. He's in fear that they'll, they'll take his harvest, they'll take his life, and they'll keep on going and hurt his family and others. So we don't have one who was an exemplary person who we could say, oh, this one pleased God. But God meets him there, and God calls him mighty man of valor. That was prophetically speaking, because he does rise to the occasion to shorten the story. But look in verse 21 of Judges 6. Then the angel of the Lord put out the end of the staff that was in Gideon's hand and touched the meat and the unleavened bread, that's a lamb and that's matzah, and fire sprang up from the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened bread. He, in essence, had a time of communion with the Lord. He, in essence, had a bit of what we read about in the Passover. But notice how God's meeting him there. God's seeing his heart, not expecting Gideon to be what God's going to make him be. But God showed his power and his acceptance of Gideon by the fire coming, consuming the, the sacrifice, consuming the meat. And... Uh, Gideon realizes, wow, I've seen God almost face to face, and, and it's amazing. It does transform him also as the story goes on. Go quickly to 1 Kings. 1 Kings, we're going to look at chapter 18. And I've got to find a better way to do this. And here's with Elijah, Eliyahu. We're going to look at all the way down at verse 38. This is the story on Mount Carmel, if you know the story. When Elijah um, is coming up against the, the uh, prophets of Baal, the false god, and, 
and he said, you know, let's see whose God is the, the powerful God, whose God is alive. So you can, you know, set up your altar and put your sacrifice there and then have your God put fire on your sacrifice to show that, that he's alive and he's real and he's, he's powerful. Anyway, I'm trying to summarize too fast. Hopefully you know the story. And after the prophets of Baal could not get anything to happen, Eliyahu takes his, his bowl that he's put on the altar. He has them soak it with so much water they had to have a moat around the altar. If you want something to catch fire, do you want it wet? No, of course not. You're going to want it dry. He's showing this is nothing I'm doing. To the contrary, this is making an impossible situation. And then he cries out to his God. And what happens in verse 38? We read in verse 38, Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. I called it a moat, but it's a trench here. Okay, so God sent so much fire, it burned up the whole thing and sucked up the water dry. <laughs> he showed he was the alive and powerful God. First Chronicles, uh, chapter 21. First Chronicles, chapter 21. Are you getting by example from these that the power of God is shown through that fire and that God is the one who is a God of fire. He is the one who has the control of the fire. He can bring it. He can withhold it. Verse 26 of chapter 21. Then David, David, so we've gone from Moses We've gone through Gideon, the time of Judges. Now we're all the way down in the time of David. In verse 26, he built an altar to the Lord there, offered burnt offerings and peace offerings, and he called to the Lord, and he answered him with fire from heaven on the altar of the burnt offering. So David made the sacrifice, but then he cried out to his God, and he said, bring the fire, and God is the one who did it. My last verse will be 2 Chronicles 7, verse 1. So we just need to go one more book over, 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 1. And there we read, now when Solomon, David's son. So we've gone from Moshe, which we're going to say 1400 plus a little bit BC. Time of Solomon is maybe about 900, moving down toward 800 BC. So at least 500 years that I've covered. Now when Shlomo, Solomon had finished praying, Fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the house. That's when he gets the temple built for his dad because David wasn't allowed to build it because he was a man of war, and his son was the man of peace, so he didn't have war in his time. Okay, so which is the offering and which is the sacrifice? Okay, we're using those terms, which is the offering, which is the sacrifice. We're really using them almost interchangeably. We bring a sacrifice as an offering to the Lord. There were offerings that were to be burnt entirely. There were offerings that were burnt. Some parts were burnt. There were offerings that the priest got to eat part of. There were offerings that the one who brought the sacrifice got to eat part of, that they had a barbecue with their friends and family afterwards. There were offerings that were not animal, that were grain and first fruits, that, that no fire was involved with those. Those are called offerings also. So we almost use the terms interchangeably, but if we want to really slice and dice it, a sacrifice would be when an animal is given its life, and it's you're giving it, so it's an offering you're giving. The offering you're giving is the sacrifice. And where does the fat come in? Well, the fat would come in when it is the, an animal, not the, the first fruits or the grain or meal offering or something like that. And I think what it's saying to us, apparently the animal was slain. I don't want to get too gross for my own sake, <laughs> but apparently it was cut. And then the fat was also burned on the altar along with the animal. And probably there were parts of the animal that were not. It probably was one of those sacrifices. We don't read it in Genesis, but by the time you get into the sacrificial system being really spelled out, like in Leviticus, you have details like that. Sometimes they were to burn the entrails and the, you know, all the innards. And sometimes it didn't speak of those things. So they had different rules for different sacrifices that were being given for different reasons. Okay, so in Abel's time, it is being made specifically clear that he gave the animal 
he gave the fat of the animal also. So there had to have been a separation. They had to have cut the fat off. According to, again, this is showing us God had to have given him instruction. Otherwise, how would he know to do that? Okay? And we are told that the fat is uh, representative, I'll put it that way, of the excellency of the person of Messiah, of his holy life. We see that in Scripture. Let me show you where. This is part of the Mosaic Law, which it does come down the line. When we're here with Cain and Abel, we don't have Mosaic Law yet. But when the Mosaic Law that I'm just now talking about, have been talking about, Let's look at the peace offering, okay? There were, like I say, there were five different offerings. I would have to take a class or two to teach you all the offerings, so right now I'm just summarizing it. But look with me at Leviticus to back up what I'm trying to say. Le Leviticus chapter 3, okay? And this has to do with um, what I just called the peace offering. <coughs> okay, we're going to look at verse 16 if I don't have to back up earlier. Um, if, take my word, if you read it earlier, you'll see that it's called the peace offering. And here's some of the detail, because I said it, let me just quickly read to you um, from verse 12 on. Moreover, if his offering is a goat, because at times it was a goat, at times it was a sheep, at times it was a bull. Sorry, my tablet, just so you all know when I get confused sometimes, my tablet just popped up over my scripture and said, coffee? Question mark. Like, do you want coffee now? <laughs> Hello. <laughs> I have no idea. But moreover, if his offering is a goat, then he shall offer it before the Lord. He shall lay his hand on the head and slay it before the tent of the meeting. So what became the tabernacle, there was the altar outside, we know that. And as the, the person bringing the sacrifice would come to the altar, that's where the animal would be mercifully slain. And then the sons of Aharon, the, the priests, shall sprinkle his blood around on the altar. So the animal's been slain now and the blood has been put on that altar in the tabernacle. <clears throat> From it he shall present his offering as an offering by fire to the Lord. So he's, he's made that sacrifice, now he's going to make it a burnt offering to the Lord. And notice what he's to do in verse 14. The fat that covers the entrails and all the fat that's on the entrails and the two kidneys with the fat that is on them, which is on the loins and the lobe of the liver, which he shall remove with the kidneys. So, you know, we got a little dissecting going on here, okay? <laughs> Wait a minute. What, where are you at? Leviticus 3. I backed up to verse 12. 16 oh, was my point. 16, so I'm going, it doesn't jive. Okay. Go oh, ahead. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay. But you, if you heard, even though you couldn't find it, and I'm sorry, I just read Leviticus 3, verses 12 through, did I get to 16? I didn't. I stopped at verse 15. I will read verse 16. But what we see is the animal was slain, and then it was dissected. And God was saying, you're to give these certain parts, all these certain parts, and he includes in it the fat. Verse 16, the priest shall offer them up in smoke on the altar as food, an offering by fire for a soothing aroma. You know how good a barbecue smells? Mm -hmm. That's the soothing aroma, okay? Sorry. I don't like this any better than a lot of you, trust me. I am so thankful I wasn't born in those days and having to be part of that. But now the next phrase, what I was bringing us to verse 16 for was, all fat is the Lord's. So the Lord was saying, the fat belongs to me. Well, that's what we see by Abel bringing the sacrifice, apparently dissecting it to some degree, and he put the sacrifice and the fat, and yes, you're going exactly where you should. And I have a dear friend whose husband used to say to her when she was disturbed about her fat, he would just look at her and say, well, honey, the fat belongs to the Lord. <laughs> so sacrifice your fat to the Lord. Now if he's telling you cut it out and put it on the altar, then you better zip your lips when it comes to eating that chocolate tonight. Rochelle, I'm speaking to you. <laughs> okay. Uh, but that's what, what God was requiring. The fat belonged to the Lord. Now to show you this more than once, go to chapter 7. Okay, and in chapter 7, we're going to read very much the same thing, verses 23 to 25, Leviticus 7, 23 to 25, speak to the sons of Israel, saying, You shall not eat any fat from an ox, a sheep, or a goat. Also the fat of an animal which dies, the fat of an animal torn by beasts, may be put to any other use, but you must certainly not eat it. 
For whoever eats the fat of the animal from which an offering by fire is offered to the Lord, even the person who eats shall be cut off from his people. You are not to eat any blood, either a bird or animal, in any of your dwellings, and it goes on. So God makes it very clear. You don't eat the fat, folks. You don't eat the fat. Now, if I brought you to a doctor today, especially one of nutrition, what would he tell you about the fat? Good for you. Roger. <laughs> and uh, which part of the law have you well, now broken? <laughs> I think that Roger is saying that it's good in taste for us, but it's bad for our health. <laughs> yes. Depends on where the fat comes from. Now, the fat from fat an avocado is healthy. We're not talking avocado. We're talking <laughs> goats. Justification. We're talking <laughs> sheep. We're talking yes. ox. You know, we're, yeah. And yes, you might like that taste in your mouth, but we all know it's the worst thing you can eat. We know it's bad. And there are plenty of us, like Emily, going like, oh, that's disgusting anyway. I <laughs> but I think that God was doing two things here. One is showing you're giving to God something that maybe you did know you liked, you know, maybe not, but you're giving something to the Lord. Secondly, I believe that God in it had their health benefit at heart because the laws that he gave them were such high purification standards that when the plagues hit that were from substandard, the fleas on the rats that were in the, the granary and the Jewish people didn't, it didn't happen because they had such a higher level of, of having to keep things pure and clean. Obviously, God was doing it for their health sake. But the point is, the fat belongs to the Lord. And that's that what he was saying. Does that apply now, too? Well, <laughs> you, does that apply now, too, is the question being asked. If you're trying to keep the law and be under the law, it absolutely does. Is the guideline still good there? Absolutely, it's still good there. Does that mean you're condemned if you put a piece of fat in your mouth tonight for dinner? <laughs> no, because remember, we're not condemned. We're out from under the condemnation, but like Paul says, that doesn't mean you're free to just go do anything. If you're convicted in your heart that that's not something good to eat, then Paul says you shouldn't be eating it. Anything you can give thanks for unto the Lord, then you can eat it. So I would say you have to get your conviction on that from the Lord. But you have to... And God do. But you have to be careful it doesn't make somebody else stumble, too, that's under... Yes, you don't want to eat something in front of someone else that you know you have the freedom to eat, but they're, they're going to trip on that, and it's going to cause them to falter in their walk with the Lord, then just don't do it in front of them. You know, in other words, yeah. that was because meat was offered to idols and then it was sold in the market. Why was it sold in the market? If it was offered to a live God, why wasn't it consumed? Because... Mm -hmm. All that was offered to the God of Israel was consumed. It wasn't sold in market later. He wasn't hungry. <laughs> but there were those who could buy that because it was cheaper, yeah. and they could buy it and they could eat it, but there were others that, that it's so, um, because it had been offered to an idol, they felt that was so wrong, it, it, you should not, you know, touch that. And so they would abstain from it, and it, it caused problems between people. So Paul said, if you're, if you're not condemned in your heart, God isn't condemning you, eat it in your house, but don't go put it out in the, you know, barbecue outside and, and call your friends and neighbors and cause people who are having trouble with it to feel like, you know, it just unbalanced them and disturbed their spirit. Don't do it in front of them. Didn't King David eat food from the idols when he was out in the wilderness? He took the bread from that was supposed to be just for the priests. Is that what you're thinking okay. of? Okay. Yeah. yeah, and it does show God does have exceptions, absolutely, because the bread that was supposed to only be for the priests, his, his army, they were starving. Yeah. And they consumed that bread, and, and we see that God was okay with that. You know, God wasn't in the letter of the law. He's in the spirit of the law. They're trying to keep the letter of the law. Even the Pharisees in Yeshua Jesus' day, you know, they were strangling the people with, you know, they, okay, God says this, you have to do this and this and this and this and that to be able to keep this. And they made it so hard nobody could do it. And it was pushing them away from God instead of it bringing them to God. So what we have, the, the picture that we're getting then is both the blood and the fat. And in, in I'm going to say in biblical days, both of those represented life that fat that was on that animal because the animal was alive. So both are representing life. Both were forbidden to be eaten under the mosaic economy. Mm -hmm. Man, because of law, being under law, isn't entitled to life. 
He's condemned to death. This is the picture I think that the Lord is trying to help them understand. The law condemns because man can't live up to his demands. Okay? Under grace, we do have more freedom. We drink, well, I'll call it juice. Some drink wine. But we say it's symbolic of his blood. Okay? We're not saying it is actually his blood, but it's symbolic. We eat the matzah, or you may do bread even. Mots is more legit, but, you know, we say that's his body, that's his life. So even in our symbols of what we're eating, it, it represents life to us. When we say uh, that he said he, he is the bread of life, John 6, we're, we're saying that's alive, and yet we're eating it. This is the picture that we're trying to show you, is that blood and fat represented life to them. And they were told that you give to the Lord, you don't eat yourself. Because they, they, even the animals that they ate after we come into the time when it was okay to eat meat, even then it was drained of its blood. They weren't to eat the blood. That's still kosher meat to this day. <clears throat> it's drained of all the blood. There goes your flavor. There goes, you know, it would be now a hard piece of jerky, basically. They spice it and do other things to make it... Mm -hmm. Well, corned beef and pastrami, and yeah, they're delicious. <laughs> <laughs> okay, back on track. Um, and, and again, when you see Yeshua Jesus being referred to when he said, I am the bread of life, he says he's the bread come down out of heaven. He refers to himself, John 6, 51. Read the, from 51 to 58. I think 35 also, John 6, 35, I think it's the first time he said, I'm the bread of life. Anyway, in that, that chapter, I'll, I'll let you look that up on your own so that we don't spend our whole class on a bloody sacrifice. Uh, but there's a lot to learn from it. But, but again, if Abel is, if it says that he brought, and I'm back in Genesis, that he brought of the firstlings of his flock, okay? So he's bringing the firstborn, the first out of anything was to be given to the Lord. When we get into law, we see that. The first fruits is the first that's being harvested. They were to do that with the fruit of the trees. They were to do that with everything. The first, and even in human life, the first out of the womb was to be dedicated to the Lord. They had a process where they did different things because of that. But here we see Abel's bringing the firstlings of the flock and of their fat. So he has had to have been given some sort of instruction to know he wasn't just bringing the animal, slaying its life, and walking away. He's now putting it on an altar. We <clears throat> presume that there had to have been fire for it to become, you know, the sacrifice of burnt offering. But it's not killed by the fire. It's slain first, and then it's burned <coughs> by the fire. Okay, and the fat also. So we see that what he well, did. Well, Rachel, can I, can I ask a question? Sure. I, I want to see if I. Um... Now you say you, they bring the the, uh, the animal sacrifice and then they slain it and then once they do that they cut off the fat or do they bring that fat from another animal? No, I I believe it's from that very animal that after it's been slain the blood has been caught in a bowl because that blood remember we read the verse where the priests sprinkled it on the altar you know and we know that the blood of the Passover lamb had to be placed on the doorpost that they had like a bowl that they even put at the base of the door after they'd done it. Yeah. So I believe that the blood was taken out from the animal and that's the animal that would then be cut and the fat would be removed, but the fat was to be given in the, with that offering also. Um, yeah, and, okay, uh, I'm still with that because you're showing us all these uh, verses which is after Genesis, mm -hmm. but prior, Right. Uh, we don't see any because, I don't know, it had to be somewhere, be, well, I don't know, because uh, uh, Abel, he was growing the animals. <laughs> with, uh, with right. And, and, and Cain, it was the, uh, the, the uh, right. vegetables and whatever. Right. So, and that's very important to see. See, what you're struggling with, if I can get you to hold on just a minute, we need to get a couple more verses under us. And I think it's going okay. to clear up. If it doesn't, please bring it back, okay? And we'll, we'll okay. go there. Okay. But I think I know where you're going, and this is what I want you to see and understand. It wasn't that you brought the best of what you did. 
If it was, then Cain did the right thing by bringing the best of the fruit that he was growing or the vegetables or whatever. But obviously, God wasn't saying, you do whatever your occupation is and then give me the best. Obviously, God had given them specific instruction. We're told in Hebrews 11 that when Abel brought the, the, from his flock, so he brought an animal sacrifice, that that was considered done by faith and he was considered righteous because of it. Well, remember how I brought out, how did Abraham get called righteous? Was he called righteous because he counted, oh, I'm going to have 1,725,000 offspring because that's how many stars he saw? No, remember as we looked at the Hebrew, it was narrate, tell the story, that in the stars he saw the gospel, he looked to the day that the sacrifice of the Lamb of God would come, shed his blood in Abraham's place, he put his faith in that, and he was called righteous. Here we've got Abel being <coughs> called righteous. He's been called righteous by faith. Because he too looked forward to that day, the same that Adam and Eve, his parents, looked forward to the day that out of her seed would come one who was going to crush Satan's head. And we know that God made a sacrifice there because he clothed them. They, were, they, were, they suddenly were aware of their nakedness and he clothed them with the skins of animals. Well, if you skinned an animal, I think that animal has lost its life. I don't, I don't think that God did a miracle and the <coughs> animal lived without its coat. You know, I think that, that we have to read and understand, not because it tells us, if it gave us every single detail, we'd never get out of the first chapters. We, it's far too much than we could, could um, learn in a lifetime even. So God's given us everything we need to know. He's outlined it. As we look on down through scripture, we see it back up what we're thinking here. Oh, okay, I get it. That's why Abel put the fat on the altar. That's why Abel brought a sheep because he learned from his parents, or I don't know, maybe God was still speaking to them some. We know in the garden, God spoke with Adam and Eve in the cool of the evening. But however it was, either directly by God or God through his parents, obviously taught Cain and Abel, because they're both their sons, would have taught them this is the sacrifice that is pleasing to the Lord. The sacrifice that you're to bring to the altar is to be an animal sacrifice. You're to bring it, you're to bring the fat. You can't bring fat from fruit. You can't bring it from veggies. And as we go down, we're going to continue to see how we can determine God wasn't choosing favor over a son. He wasn't saying, I like this one, I don't like this one. It's he had issue with their sacrifices, with what they were, or with their offerings. I can't call it a sacrifice because you can offer fruit, but you can't sacrifice it. It's not a lot. Okay, now does this, um, whatever you want to call it, does it have a name? Because all the others, the first, first fruits, you bring the fruit, the games, you bring the, uh, and this one, what do you call it? I would tend to think, and I'd have to look at the names um, later. The one that comes to mind is the one that we just read. I would tend to think we're looking at what becomes called later, becomes called the peace offering, I would think. There's, like I said, five different offerings, and I'm trying to remember the, all their names. I'll bring you back their names and like a one-sentence summary for each one next week, since you're interested enough in that. Um, but uh, that's where we would only be guessing. It sounds like it's this offering. Okay, because they don't do it every year, do they? Like everything else? They, th these offerings were far more often than the once a year Yom Kippur offering. They, they gave these offerings. If they committed sin, there was a sin for sin offering. That's another name of one. There was the peace offering. There were different offerings for different times, for different occasions that they were doing, at least by the time law is established. Now, prior to law, I don't know. Maybe there was only one. Maybe they only did it. I'm, I'm guessing here. Total guess, folks. I'm not saying it's in Scripture. But let's say maybe they brought a sacrifice every Shabbat. Mm -hmm. The day that they set aside to honor the Lord, they brought a sacrifice to the Lord. You know, maybe it wasn't that often. I don't know because we're not told. By the time we get into law and God spells it out, he tells them when to do it, how often to do it, which kind to do 
you know, and again, if they knew that they had sinned, they could bring a sin offering. So that could happen again and again and again and again for someone who was living a rebellious life, but really didn't want to, but just wasn't right with the Lord, you know, as they should be. Okay, Rachel, it will be like the burnt offering, uh, the grain offering. Yes. And it will be the peace offering. And a meal offering. Uh, the sin offering. And the meal offering. offering. And, the, and the guilt offering. And the guilt offering. Okay, I thought one was called meal. See, I'm fuzzy on it, but there you go. <laughs> Say them again, please. Oh, okay, yeah. The, the, the first one is the burnt offering. And then the second one, a grain offering. And the other one, peace offering, which is the number third. The fourth is sin offering. And the fifth is a guilt offering. Okay, okay. And that's where you have to break them down to begin to see what the differences mm -hmm. are. Right. This one could be easily the peace offering. It could have been the burnt offering. You know, I can't tell mm -hmm. you which one, and it didn't matter in the sense that we don't even know if, if they were bringing more than the one. But we know they were they were to bring the one. And it sounds like because Cain and Abel are adults now, this isn't the first time. This is something that's been going on. Mm -hmm. Okay, but it's the first time that Cain's decided, hey, I'm going to bring the first fruits from my land. Maybe he had a really good crop that year, <laughs> that time. You know, I don't know, but let's read and see because I want to make sure we cover to get Maria's questions answered also. So let's see what we can glean and understand and see if, if we answer or if we left, you know. I mean, there might be some things we still have to ask the Lord when we get home. But yeah. <laughs> we do have the fact, a little bit more I know we can know because I've, I've studied it further than verse 4. So we know in verse 4, the, what Abel brought, and I want to stress that the Lord had regard for it. That means he was accepting of it. He respected it. It was a blood sacrifice. We know that was God's demand for sin. So in essence, when Abel brought the sheep to the, the altar, he was saying, I am a sinner. I need to pay the penalty for my sin, and I believe that this is a picture of the one who will come who will pay my penalty for me. So he's looking to the Lamb of God who take away the sin of the world. That's why Hebrews 11.4 said it was by faith, okay? And it makes it clear the Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering. The Lord respected his offering. The Lord acknowledged that that offering was acceptable to him. Now here's our opposite, but for Cain, for Cain and for his offering, he had no regard. He did not respect what Cain brought. He didn't respect it. it. It could have been the best of the best. It could have been the shiniest, the biggest, reddest, shiniest apple, <laughs> whatever you want it to be. It could have been the best of the best of the best. He had that one prized fruit, and he says, I'm going to give that to the Lord. But if the Lord has said, thou shalt bring a blood sacrifice, mm -hmm. then that's what you need to do. Now, could Cain have also brought and given the Lord something else on top of? Sure. I'm not going to argue that point. But the point is, he didn't bring it also. He brought it in its stead. So what we have is Cain saying, hey, I'm going to bring this to the Lord. Okay? Now, if fire fell on Abel's, and this is reading in between the lines, but I'm presuming because I see fire fall from heaven every time God was pleased that I just read to you all the way through, all those examples I gave, then probably Abel's sacrifice, he probably didn't like the match, okay? <laughs> God brought the fire on that sacrifice. Obviously, that showed God was pleased with it. He accepted it. All is good. Now here's Cain's over here, there's no fire, there's no way that, that we're seeing any indication from the Lord that he was saying it was good, and furthermore, we have that the Lord did not respect it. So if fire did fall on Abel's, fire did not fall on Cain's, okay? Now. So, you, you know, and it makes sense when it, when it says, uh, you know, in Genesis, what that God asks uh, uh, um, Cain, why are you upset? 
Okay, you're ahead. Slow <laughs> down. <laughs> I'll give you an A plus. You're putting it together and you've read the chapter. I'm proud of you. <laughs> but yes, keep those wheels turning because now you're answering some yeah. of your own questions too. But yes, he did not say anywhere in that verse that he did not like Cain. He didn't say, I think less of Cain. He made it very clear he's not talking about the person of Cain and the person of Abel. He was not pleased with the offer, with what was being offered, with this sacrifice, with whatever you want to call it. That was what was unacceptable. Now, as we look further in Scripture, and we have to look down, you know, to look back and understand, we do come to those verses, Leviticus 17, 11. I've said it to you many a time. Let me read it to you. So I do exactly without, uh, without leaving anything out because I want you to see is God's words. We have there very clearly what God is saying needs to be brought to him. This is called the blood of atonement, Leviticus 17, 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. Okay, now, there's no life, there's no blood in fruit and vegetables, okay? They're not alive. When you eat an apple, a peach, a, a veggie, you're not eating something that was alive. Yes, they grow, but they're not alive. It's not life in them. So, the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I, God speaking, have given it to you on the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood by reason of the life that makes atonement. There had to been a life given. There had to been blood shed. That's what he's saying in Leviticus 17.11. Now, go with me back to Hebrews, our book to our Hebrew people to help them understand the better because remember, that's our key word for the book of Hebrews, everything is better. So we have a better blood sacrifice in Hebrews. In Hebrews 9.22, it says, is it 20? Yeah, 22. I'm reading 23, that's my problem. And according to the law, one may almost say, all things are cleansed with blood. Almost everything could be cleansed, could be purified, could be forgiven, the, the sin removed, um, cleansed with blood. And without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So that fruit that Cain brought had no blood shed. There's no forgiveness. Remember, they're bringing the sacrifice to show, I am a sinner. I need to be forgiven. So in essence, Cain is not saying to God, I'm a sinner and I need to be forgiven. But he's really saying, I'm a good person. I did good things. Look at the work of my hands, and I'll give you the very best, God. But you see what he's doing? Do you see the comparison? I can put it in one word. Same thing that started this whole thing with Satan. Pride. Pride. You said it. Emily got A+. Plus. Pride. I'm a good person. I've brought the best. I've really learned how to work this ground, and look at what I brought, and I'm bringing it to you. And that's what's taking place here in Chapter 4. Abel is saying, woe is me, I am a sinner, I need a savior, I need forgiveness for my sin, and thank you God that this animal can die in my stead as a picture that I believe that day is coming when you will put blood on the altar for the forgiveness of my sin. Where do you see Cain saying any of that? You, you don't see, not a smidge of that in it. Instead, I want to do it my way. And we all know that that's the problem with man, inherent throughout. I don't care where you grow up. I don't care what your background is. I don't care whatever. That's man's inherent, I'm going to do it my way. I'm a good person. I'm this, I'm that. Nothing ever can equal what God says is required. The blood sacrifice, a life spent to bring the, the greater life to them. So Cain and Abel had the very same environment. They had the same heredity. In other words, the parents are the same. The nature around them is the same. They're living the same life. We're not living with different circumstances. This one was poor, this one was rich. No, none of that. But they both acted very, 
Well, I'll use the word, they acted opposite of each other when it came to being obedient to what God had commanded. Obviously, God had given them commandment, had given them instruction, the same way God said to Adam and Eve in the garden, thou shalt not eat from this one tree. God had had to spell out to, to Adam and Eve, and either they passed it down to the children, or God had kept instructing whichever way, that it had to be that clear. So Cain knew what he was doing, and we're going to see that. That's where Maria was going. We're going to see that in his attitude. Okay, Cain's going to be a type of the first man, Adam, the flesh man, the sinful man, the one that, that here we find sin, we find disobedience, and we find death, and we all got to inherit that. We get that by birth, and we know it. <laughs> it's common to the human race. Okay, I don't care whether you're male or female, whether you're born in a palace or in a shack, whether you're a different color of skin, it doesn't matter, that's all in here. Everyone's born with that sin nature and considered to be from the first man, Adam. Scripture calls Yeshua Jesus the second Adam. That's in, um, is it 1 Corinthians 15, 47? I have that reference, let's see if that is. If it's not, I'll get you the reference later. But we have where Yeshua Jesus is referred to as the second because he came in human form, took that on, was fully God at the same time so he could live that perfect life, so he could atone for sin by his blood, and it wouldn't be for his own sin. And um, it is hinted at in this verse. There's another verse, too. I almost got the reference. But anyway, here... The first man is from the earth, earthy, that's our, our Adam that was created in the earlier chapters in Genesis. The second man is from heaven. The second Adam is from heaven. That's, that's the Lord Jesus, and it's referring to him in his human form, but he came from heaven because he was divinely God. And that is where? That was 1 Corinthians 15, 47. There's still another verse. It'll come back hopefully. The Adam was what? Earthy, flesh. You know, so Cain's going to represent the earthly fret, flesh, say that three times fast, and Abel's going to show us the spiritual side. Because when we come into Christ, we're born again. We get that spiritual nature. That's what we're going to see a contrast from. We are born naturally the first time. We're born by faith the second time, okay, into the spiritual, okay? It's called being born again. When we look at John 3, when Yeshua said to Nicodemus, you had to be born again. And he says, hello, it, how's that possible? I'm a full-grown man. How could I possibly be born again? And Yeshua says, you have to be born of the spirit and of the blood, the, sac the sacrifice blood. You, know, you have to be born of the spirit, spiritual. So let's look back at Cain because he's going to have a reaction to this that tells us where he's at in this picture. Did he just not get educated well? Did he not understand? Was he confused? Was this an, oops, I made a mistake, God? Let's see how he responds, okay? Because obviously, very quickly, everybody knows Abel's sacrifice has been accepted and Cain's has not. God has had no respect for it, and I'm hunting for where we are. Okay, but for Cain and his offering, verse 5, he, God, had no regard. So here's Kion, Cain's reaction. He became very angry, and his countenance fell. The Hebrew says he glowed. You ever seen somebody so mad, so full of anger, that they're putting off a glow? That's anger to the nth degree. That's not just, I don't like this. That's anger. That's, that's coming from a spirit very deeply. If he had the right spirit before God, he wouldn't have become angry at God's correction. He wouldn't have refused God's correction. He would have humbly said, you know, I'm sorry. I thought because I was bringing you the best. This was a good idea. I see it's not. I, I humbly bow before you. Let me go get a, a, a sheep from the flock and let me make the sacrifice like you said before. So it wasn't that he got an idea and thought, oh, wow, this will really please God. No, he had no desire to please God. He's angry that God's not pleased with him. The audacity of God to turn down his best. How many are wanting to stand before God in that same way, though? 
How dare you not let me into heaven, God? I am a good person. I live by the good book. I did all kinds of good deeds. How dare you not let me in? Well, well, let's see what happens here, okay? I'll leave that for people to draw their own, you know, where they can. It says also his countenance fell. That means his face literally fell. You ever seen somebody whose face is one way and all of a sudden whoosh, and you know something has deeply disturbed them? That's what we're saying here. It could be, and I'm reading it, so I'm not saying it's definite, but it could be that up until this point, Cain's been kind of burning with this. I don't like having to go get a flock, a sheep from my brother's flock. I don't like having to follow the rules. I don't like painting within the lines. I don't want to paint outside the lines. But I'm stewing on the inside, and I'm keeping it on the inside. I haven't let it out yet. But to have this strong of a reaction at this point, I think it's revealing what was inward. I think that we're seeing this This didn't come overnight. This didn't come accidentally. This was showing that his heart had been becoming more and more hardened against this. I don't like it. I want to do it my way. Did he not have his own flock? No. Even a small Appar family? Apparently not. Apparently <clears throat> Abel raised the sheep. Mm -hmm. Cain raised the fruit, the vegetables. They Maybe he was always jealous of his brother. I would say so. Okay, we might be getting something there. Keep that thought in there. They're saying maybe he was jealous of his brother. Let's see, because again, we're seeing an inward pride. We're seeing a resentment. We're seeing it in his face and his reactions. Let's see if there's any chance that he could have been resentful toward his brother, that he could have some animosity there. Okay, Let, let's keep reading our story. And I lost my place. That's why you see me hesitating for a minute. Okay. So his countenance fell at the end of verse 5. Verse 6. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why has your countenance fallen? Okay. God's appealing to Cain. Hey, what's the problem here? Why are you so angry? Why has your face fallen? What I see in this is God is working with Cain. He's almost, in essence, pleading with Cain. What's the problem? You know, let's get this taken care of, you know, and he's he's not just saying, oh, you're done, crispy critter, you know, I'll make you the sacrifice. <laughs> he doesn't. He's, he talks with him and he says, if you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? Hey, this can all be straightened out. You want it, your face up again? You want to feel good again? You want to have that lightness of spirit again? That's still very possible. But if you don't do well, Sin is crouching at the door. Okay, now, and by the way, the, the countenance falling also has a brooding spirit. You know, that's also in the Hebrew meaning, you know. It's, a, it's showing thought, it's showing time. It's not just an, oops, I made a mistake and I, I need to be corrected. Yes? Like the, the kid that was standing in the corner, sitting in the corner. I'm standing on the inside, but I'm sitting on the outside, you know. If you didn't hear Roger, the kid that his mom punished him, made him go sit in the corner, and he went and he, got, and he sat down in the corner and he had his back to his mother and he says, well, I may be sitting on the outside, but I'm standing up on the inside. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the idea. Okay, if you do well, if you offer the correct offering, just correct yourself here, King, is what God's saying. If you do well, it can be well with you. If you refuse to do what is being told you have to do, then there's going to be a consequence. And what is it he tells them? Sin is crouching at the door. Mm -hmm. It's desires for you, but you must master it. Okay, the Hebrew for crouching gives us the idea that God is telling Cain, you need to resist the sin. You need to fight against the sin. If you want blessing, you want your countenance lifted, you have to resist the sin. If you don't, if you give in to the sin, you're going to be devoured. You're going to be eaten up. You're going to be consumed by it. The crouching at the door, sin is crouching at your door, could be interpreted in two different ways, and maybe even both are correct. One is that this sin nature was crouching at his heart's door. It was ready to devour him. You give in to this, you're, you're going to go the whole way into sin, and that's going to be your bend. In essence, you're going to be becoming Satan's 
let's say because of Genesis 3.15, let's say you're Satan's seed. It doesn't mean Satan gave birth, but you're going to be his offspring because remember, the Lord's going to crush what comes against him, which is Satan and all of his cohorts. It's not just Satan alone. So in essence, when it's saying sin's crouching at your door, if you don't resist this king, you're going to become a party with Satan. You're going to be part of his army. You're going to go the whole way into to a, a sinful life here. Um, the same Hebrew word, though, is used for the sin and the sin offering. So the idea could also be, you've got the problem. We're looking at the problem. Your solution's right here at the door. There is an offering that can be made for your sin that can straighten out this whole thing. I kind of tend to think both are being said to Cain. If you keep going down this path, disaster. You're only going to fall into the pit. And you're going to suffer in the pit with Satan. If you turn, there is an offering for you right here. You can. God's not saying it's over. You can turn, do right, and he will forgive. You can bring that offering of the flock. You can right your wrong. It sounds like that because he says, you must master it. Now, we all know that sinful nature inside of us. We have to master it. We don't master it in our own power. We master it by the Lord. But if we walk according to the flesh, we sow according to the flesh, we reap according to the flesh, and that's a whole heartache. If we walk in the Spirit and we sow according to the Spirit, in the power of the Spirit, we reap blessing from the Lord, and we know it. So we can see both of those possibilities there, that God was telling Cain, Cain, you know, you, you've got to, who are you going to put on the throne? You've got to make a decision. If you don't want to go down that path, you have right here what you need. We have right here what we need. We have the spirit to live the life that we need to live. We have the, the right when we make a mistake to, uh, and now it's just pictured in it, but remember the offering, this offering for sin. We can come back to the Lord. We can thank the Lord. I am already forgiven, but I confess my sin to you. I humble myself before you. I line up to be obedient. And that's what he's telling Cain. It's not over, Cain. You have a chance, but you've got to make that decision, and you have to become the master of your decision. You can have victory, or you can fall all the way down into the pit. Let me take you to Romans 6 and show you that's our battle today, the way I've just described it also. Romans 6, we're going to look at verse 16 first, and then we're going to back up to verses 12 and 13. Um, the whole thought is there from 12 to 16, but I'm going to give you the end and then give you what, what's leading up to it. Uh, Romans 6, verse 16, we read, Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey? If you, and especially in that day they had slaves, if you say, I'm going to be your slave, you're going to be my master, now you are going to obey that master. If that master says, go chop the wood, you're going to go chop the wood. If the master says, you know, go to town and shop for me, you're going to go to town and shop for him. You're going to be obedient to him. And here it's saying in verse 16, um, okay, you present yourselves as slaves for obedience, you're slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death, or of obedience resulting in righteousness. So now we're taking it out of the, the world, the flesh, we're putting it into the spirit. When you make yourself a slave, you either make yourself a slave to, and the first was given, where to go? The first was sin, and that's going to lead you to death because you're putting yourself under the control of the master of sin. And that means you're going to be, Satan's going to be your master, and you're going to do his bidding. Okay, and that's going to lead you to death, or you can be obedient, resulting in righteousness. Remember, Abel, Abraham were called righteous. If you choose to be, a, and, and I say it in all the right way, a slave to Yeshua Jesus, he's your master, that's going to bring you into righteousness and life everlasting. So the choice is yours. It's there. The sin offering was available for Kion to use it, but he had to choose it. God wasn't going to force him. He wasn't going to do it for him. Cain had to choose it. Now, very likely what we were just talking about, 
because he'd have to take it from Abel's flock, it could be that he had to humble himself to go to his brother to say, you know, I need to, and I would imagine it would be a barter system. I'll give you that choice fruit. You give me one of the, the, the purest lambs you can because it had to be a lamb without blemish and all of that. And it could be that God was even reminding Cain, if you'll humble yourself and go to your brother and get that, you'll stay in the position you're in. What position was he in? He was firstborn. We know what the firstborn means later down the line. It may have been important here also. You'll keep that position over Abel as long as you are living righteously, living unto the Lord. And it could be that Cain has been bristling at Abel's doing the right thing and maybe even that's kind of preached at Cain because maybe he saw Abel doing it with such a heart of Lord I'm so sorry and he knew he wasn't doing it that way and he knew he should be doing it that way so Abel's life has been convicting him Abel's life has been bothering him if you're in the life of an unbeliever you you uh, rub them wrong what do you call it you, you know you can you bring conviction to them where if you're not living that way they don't have any problem with you you know as long as you're party with them and their stuff everything's good so it could be that Abel's kind of been rising up in the spiritual and Cain knows he's been going down and he doesn't like that I don't you know he's my little brother <laughs> we have no idea this is where I am reading in but it could be that, that God was even reminding him, you will retain that right of the firstborn. You will have that position as long as you're living it righteously. You follow in line. Here's, here's you know, a good reason too. I can't tell you that for sure, but I know Cain started having issue with his brother. That part I can tell you because of the next verse. So look with me at verse 8. Did I see a hand? No, okay. Verse 8 of chapter 4, Genesis. Cain told Abel his brother. Okay, I find that very interesting. What does that mean? You may have he talked with Abel. Okay, they had conversation. See, remember, we're just given an outline. These kids grew up together. They had, you know, life together. They watched their kids start to, you know, they had kids who had kids. And, you know, life went on. We're just given a little snippet here. But it, let me show you about Abel by going to um, Luke 11. Let's see what scripture says about Abel here. We know what it said in Hebrews, but let me get you to Luke 11 and show you something else with thinking about what they were talking about. Okay, Luke 11, we're going to look at verses 49 to 51. 49 says, For this reason also the wisdom of God said, I will send to them prophets and apostles, and some of them they will kill, some of them they will persecute, so that the blood of all the prophets shed from the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation. Wow, that's a long time, okay? This is in Yeshua Jesus' day, this is our first century AD, so all those BC years, about 4,000 years, we've got that the Lord saying that since the foundation of the world, this, the blood of the prophets could be charged against these people from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who was killed between the altar and the house of God. And then it goes on. So Abel... What, what, what verse are you reading, I'm sorry? Luke 11. Oh, Luke, Luke 11. 11. Okay. 49 to 51. Oh. Yeah, sorry. It should be on your cross-reference yeah. pages, okay? If you have them. And by the way, I should have told you all it was in your email early, early, early this morning. I didn't get it to you way ahead, but if we're on to the next page, they were there for you. Um, any of you who I'm e emailing them to. Um, but Okay, so in these verses in Luke, Abel's being called a prophet. What's the definition of a prophet? The one that tells before. Very good. Foretelling. Foretelling and foretelling of, of what the Lord wants said foretelling is um, when you foretell you you see before it and you speak prophetically when you're foretelling you're declaring still speaking as a prophet for God a representative of God 
So in this case, Abel is speaking for God. Abel is speaking the voice of God, and Abel is probably doing both, also foretelling. Because every time he's making that animal sacrifice, he's saying, I know there's a day coming when the Lamb of God is going to take away the sin of the world. So he, in essence, by his actions, has been a prophet to king. He's been preaching to him, he's been talking to him, he's been telling him, whether it's been in so many words or not, it's at least been in his actions, and it probably has been admonishing king. He's been bristling against it. I don't like that. I don't want it that way. How many times have I heard in, in my ministry, and I'm sure it's true in the Gentile world too, I don't want to think that somebody had to suffer for me. I don't want to think that they had to shed their blood for me. I, I don't like that. No, I, I, I want to do it a different way. Okay, but God doesn't give us room for that. We don't, we're not given that choice. So by this point, by God speaking to Cain now, he has to realize that he's losing it in God's sight. He's not doing right. He's not pleasing God. And God's warning him, you stand to lose it all. If, whether or not there was rights of the firstborn or not, whatever, he was standing, he was taking the chance now. If he kept <coughs> going, he's going to be consumed by sin. He's going to go down the path. He's going to be one with Satan, and he's going to end up in the pit. So what can we say? This, these are seeds of pride. These are seeds of, I, he could be envying the fact that Abel's doing it right. He's envious of his brother. It could be bringing up hatred. You know, he, he, this is bitter fruit. He's not now dealing with sweet, good fruit that he's done from the land. This is bitter fruit. And it quite possibly was that there had been conversations, you know, that maybe Cain was trying it out on Abel first and saying, you know, I think one time I'm going to bring my best. I want God to see. I'm giving him the best of my hands. Well, remember what he's working with? He's working with a cursed earth. He's not mm -hmm. going to ever grow a perfect fruit or vegetable, and his hands are not perfect. They're, they're under the curse of sin. So he's not going to be able to do something that's that good, that could be acceptable. It's going to fall short of God's standard. So he's getting envious of the fact that my best is being called not good enough, and here's my little brother, and all he's doing is just bringing us sheep. Uh, you know, I just, mm, you know, so envy, hatred, who knows what all is burning up inside of him. But I have a feeling they had a lot of conversations. I could be wrong. But I have a feeling there, there were previous ones because this one in particular, and then I'll get whatever question that I just saw, but let me finish my thought. This one tells us, and I, I've got to go back to um, Genesis, because um, in verse 8 it says, Cain told Abel his brother. Okay, he's talking to him about it. God's not happy with what I'm doing. I got this argument going with God, whatever he's telling him. And it came about when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. Now, again, we don't know exactly what the words mean, but it very easily could be leading us to believe Cain started premeditating. He was getting so angry at his brother. Anger brings death. It brings murder. It brings, it, well, murder. I'm just going to stop right there. It could be Cain started premeditating. One day I'm going to take my brother out. Then I'm not going to have the competition with my brother. I'll just get him out of the way. Then I'm going to be the only one. I'll have no problem. Then God will have to take my first fruits because he's not going to get a sheep from my brother. <laughs> it, it could very well be premeditated that Cain was watching for opportunity. When they were out in the field, who can Abel turn to for help? He can't holler, help, help when he's out in the field and everybody's in the house or wherever they are. The idea is King got his brother alone. Now, whether we're reading too much in or not, I can't tell you because we also know in our world today that there is the not premeditated murder. Out of a moment of rage, they rose up and boom, they did the deed and they killed somebody. We see both. God knows the intents, but the fact that he was dealing with Cain's heart Warning King, talking about the tug at the heart, says to me, there's a battle going on in his heart. And I do tend to think it was building up, building up, building up, and he was becoming more and more angry. 
And probably at first he, he didn't necessarily want to kill his brother, but it built to that point. I kind of tend to think so. Could be wrong. But it could have been sudden. But he didn't restrain himself. He acts on it. And we see the, the horrible result is it brought literal death. Yes. I wonder, too, if, if Cain looks at Abel like, you know, you're just walking around with a bunch of sheep. Go here, go there. I got to till the ground, plant the ground, pull it all up. Do it all over again every year up here, up here, and you just walk around and. Maybe so. Maybe you know. he thought his life was a lot harder and he deserved a better whatever. Whatever it is. It's a result of the sin nature. Yeah. We do see that there was um, a struggle, a, an enmity between the serpent's offspring, we'll call it his seed, and the righteous. Okay? We do see, <coughs> you know, we're seeing flesh and we're seeing spiritual. Yes, Emily. Okay, it says field. What field? Abel's field or Cain's field? Or... Well, we don't really know, but I kind of tend to think that he probably got him over in his field, in Cain's field. I would think it would be his territory. Yeah, yeah, and where he's on his own turf. Yeah, yeah. Sounds um, like Cain wants to have God's blessings, but he doesn't want to give up his bad habits. Right, he wants it his way. Not have yeah. taken either two. Yeah, exactly, that's what he wanted. Um, we do begin to see King's motive in Scripture when we look at 1 John 3.12. Okay, again, these are hints for us, and I'm not telling you, and if you don't want to believe it my way, you're absolutely free to think it was just 100% sudden, boom, First John, and done. 1 John 3.12. I'm not telling you, you have know, to think... Uh, uh, Michelle, I'm thinking of making a comment. You know, like, um, like you were saying on... Uh, uh, Genesis 4, 8, now, uh, now Cain talked with Abel, his brother. Mm -hmm. Now, there is a, a semicolon that, and it came to pass. So, meaning, like, like we were, we're kind of, like, uh, analyzing it, that maybe when he was talking to, to Cain, I mean, to Abel, Cain was saying, you know, come, come and, and, and see me at my place, or, you know, at my field, or something, mm -hmm. and it came to pass. Right, right. Like could that. be, could be. Yes. Because Let's, it doesn't say it doesn't say and he killed. But it says it came to pass when they were in the field that he rose up. That came rose up. It doesn't. It doesn't say that when he was talking with him. Okay. You see what I'm saying? So are because you saying that now came talked with Abel, his brother? Do you think that he lured? Are you saying you think he lured him into the field that he didn't right. meditate? Like, exactly, like saying, you know, hey brother, you know, why don't we just meet at my place, whatever. And, and, he says, and it came to pass when they were in the field. Okay, so that would sound like premeditated because why else is it brought out that it's in the field? It wasn't at the point here where it was a sudden, and that goes with the attitude that's been growing that we're seeing. It could very well be. You know, when you're being convicted, it's a miserable feeling. And I'll just give you an example, and I will leave names out, but my father was witnessing to a Jewish family. Part of the family had accepted the Lord, part had not. There were three brothers in this family. One was not in the house when my dad had come over this day, but my dad would go visit often, you know, trying to reach them and help them spiritually. And he was in the house with the ones who were believers. Everything was fine. The one who was not a believer yet came home, came into the house, saw my dad, and you saw the anchor right away. His, his countenance fell, okay? <laughs> he, he, oh, he didn't like my dad. Uh, my dad still was trying to reach out to him and left, the same way I see God trying to reach out to Cain. Hey, it doesn't have to be this way. They started talking, and my dad was very good about not forcing that he would hold conversation with somebody. So if they, you know, are arguing with him, my dad would bring, you know, responses. And as he saw, you know, the man getting angry, he wanted to, to calm him down. He wasn't meaning to agitate him. But I, I guess, I think the man must have said something too about why do you keep saying these things to me? You know, why do you, you know, just, you know, leave me alone? And my dad said to, to him, called him by name and said, if I saw that your house was on fire, I would want to tell you your house is on fire because I want to help you. You know, you've got a problem here. Let's put your fire out. And 
the man understood that, but then my dad took it to the, the next level, and he said, I see your spiritual house on fire. He was trying to help him see, I, I see, you know, something I'm concerned for you. Well, the man went ballistic in, in a fit of rage, lunged at my dad, and if the brothers hadn't been there, I probably wouldn't have had my dad come home that day, because you're talking one huge against, even though my dad held his own well, <laughs> yeah, I, you know, and rage overpowers anyway. But I can see both in that. It had been building up in this man, and it also was in an instant. So really we can see both and it doesn't much matter but we do see the heart motive here in first john 3 12 it says not as cain who was of the evil one and slew his brother so obviously by the time he's slaying his brother he's under the persuasion and the power of satan not that that's an excuse that's a, just a fact you're either under the power of yeshua jesus or you're under the power of satan and you choose which power you're going to be under because everyone gets to individually choose. So and here it's... Who, who, is, who are you a slave of? <laughs> exactly. Who are you a slave of? Remember the verse earlier. Perfect, Maria. Exactly. Yes. Romans 6.14. Yes, Romans 6.14. Thank you. I mean, Perfect. 6.16. 6, 6, 6, 12 to 16. Read all the verses because it yes. was in there. Yes. Okay? And for what reason did he slay him? Why did he do this? because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Mm -hmm. So not only were his deeds wrong, but his brothers is making his look so bad. You know, if you wanna know how black something is, put up something white. The contrast, whoa, you really see it. If I could take, and I don't have a way with Zoom, but if I could take a piece of white paper, pure white, put a light on it, it's brilliant white. Now I'm going to take a black ink pen and I'm going to put one dot in the middle of the paper and all of a sudden that whole picture just changed, didn't it? Even in your mind's eye, it's not any longer beautiful and, and glory and bright and light. Now it's got a spot on it. And for a lot of people, you're going to want to go wipe that spot out, <laughs> okay? This is what we're seeing is, is his motive, his, his heart is going to say sadly that's the path he's choosing that's what's happening he could have even said something to Abel like a blood sacrifice is required a blood sacrifice as you want I'll make you the blood sacrifice and boom did it in an act you know I'm not telling you those are his words but he was talking with them I can tell you that and I can tell you they were ugly words um, what we see in it is Satan's attempt his first attempt I believe since Adam and Eve that we have in scripture to prevent the fulfilling of what God had prophesied that if he could destroy the seed of the woman and out of that seed is to come the Messiah if he can destroy that seed he's going to corrupt one and he's going to have the other dead mm -hmm. they've got two sons that we know about they may have had more but here's what we see in our picture I believe this was Satan's attempt to take it out right there. Now, how is Messiah going to come, is what his thought is. Of course, God has greater ways because he does kill off one and he does corrupt the other, but it doesn't stop God's plan. But in Satan's mind, he's doing all he can to come against that promised seed that's going to come. Well, what happens back in our story? Let's go back to Genesis 4. Did I answer all your questions, Maria, from earlier? King's yes, thoughts, his motive, yeah. Okay, I thought we would as yeah, we went it, through it. Yeah, it just, yeah, it, it really did, and, and uh, especially this, when, you know, Cain killed Abel, um, it's, as, as we were reading it, you know, that he was talking with him, we don't know what it was said. It could have been, like you said, it could have been arguing, or Abel was not arguing. It is, it is uh, Cain was arguing, I think. Absolutely. But if we see it the other, the other way, can you say, you know, I, I need to talk to you about something. I don't think he was not mad. He was angry inside, but he was just like trying to lure him into a place where he could kill him. Right, right. I tend to agree with you. I do think that's what was happening. I just saw the clock. Let me hurry through a couple verses yes. real quick. <laughs> I'm sorry. We've got verse 9. The Lord no, said to it, King. It's, it's good. It's good. 
it, it is good, and I want us to think, and we can come back here, but I don't want to leave it in that middle. I want to get a little further, and mm -hmm. we can come back to this. But what did the Lord say to Cain? Where is Abel, your brother? Now, obviously we know God knew where Abel was. God wasn't questioning because he didn't know. But he's giving Cain an opportunity to come clean. Repent about what you did. The same way when he, he confronted Adam and Eve after they had sinned. You know, he, he asked some questions. He knew. He knew all the answers, but he asked some questions. But notice we see Cain again. We get an idea of where he was coming from. He doesn't say, uh-oh, I'm in trouble. I, I did something bad, God. We don't see a contrite heart. We don't see any softening. We see anger here still. I do not know. In fact, he goes further than that. I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? <laughs> Hello. <coughs> He's covering up his sin with a lie now. Uh, he knew where Abel was. He knew right where he left that body because I don't think that, that he, you know, even if he moved the body, no one else came and did it. So he knew. He's covering it up with a lie, and Satan, we know, is the father of all lies. John? Well, yeah, not, not only so much with a lie because he just, of course, he knew where he brought further was because they had to kill him. But, but also, it, it, it represents us, I would say, because when we are cut, in a lie or something that we are not supposed to be doing instead of humbling ourselves and saying you know what i messed up my fault my bad we become defensive right because we are trying to justify the wrong that we've done right justify it cover it up whatever i will say he there was a lie in there because satan's the father of all lies yes. john 8 44 He's, he's now lying on top of his murder that he's committed, and it shows me no fear of God. He's not humbling himself. He's not, uh-oh, I'm caught. He's not showing that he's miserable. He's just, he's got no fear of God. He boldly questions God's right to ask him. He doesn't show contrition. He doesn't show a heart that's saying, forgive me, for I have sinned. That's what, remember the thief on the cross? Hey, bud, to the other thief, you and I, we deserve this. That one doesn't. He wanted forgiveness. We don't see any of that in Cain. We don't even mm -hmm. see, well, Adam, go to his father. Adam, when he was caught, he did first try to cover up, but then we see that heart of repentance. Let me just take you to that. That's Genesis chapter 3 and verse 10. And in 3 and verse 10, we have, I heard the sound of you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. Uh-oh, I got a problem, God. So, yeah, I hid myself. We see it lead toward Adam's repentance. We're going to keep going because we're not covering this all. We're going to pick this up next week. We're going to see that Cain continues that hardening of his heart. We don't see a softening. We don't see a repentance. We don't see a turning back. Okay? We don't see, you know, any of us at any time. No, we can come to God and say, I'm sorry. And we know what God's response to us would be. But we're not going to see that in Him. I, and that's another reason why I think this has been festering for a long time. This is built up because it's been hardening His heart. Hardening His heart. Hardening His heart. Hardening His heart. Remember when... Pharaoh's heart was hardened even by God. And I said, how does God harden a heart? Then you, and Pharaoh could say, well, that's not fair. You hardened my heart, God. I didn't have a choice. No. God hardened his heart by bringing him light, by bringing him the truth. You put wax and you put clay under the sunlight. One melts and one hardens. That heart in the light that Abel was shedding on Cain, it was hardening his heart when it should have been softening his heart. And we'll look next week. We're going to see um, how God deals with it, what God's response is. And I'll give you a thought question. Do you think you'll see Cain in heaven one day? Did he never repentance? Read the verses that follow. <laughs> see what you think. Is what you said accurate scripturally, Dora? Back it up. Well, the and Lord the certainly did give him opportunity after opportunity after opportunity for him to 
repent, confess of his sins, come to the Lord, because the Lord doesn't want to lose any of us. Nope, nope. So, you know, but it's like we, the same with us, over and over and over again. Right, but is anyone beyond forgiveness? What do we see as we follow King? And that's where I want you to look ahead, read ahead, read the verses, see where Cain ends up. I'm going to take you through a contrast next week, through a very secular line and a very spiritual line. Very interesting. Seven generations down from Adam, we're going to have two very different people here. And what we see and learn from them is very interesting. That's why I'm not going to go into that at 3.50. I'm already well over the time. But I love your thoughts. I'm not saying I agree or disagree because I don't want the discussion over today. I want you to think for a little while. I want you to look at the scriptures. I want you to see what goes on. And I want you to come to final conclusions. Um, and I'm not here to say that it has to be my way, but you'll hear this argument all through time. You'll hear people ask you, is Judas Iscariot in heaven? You know, did, did, do, what do we see? You know, Many, many other questions like it. That's why I'm introducing it to you here. We'll talk about why we can think what we want to think, but we'll talk about the final answer, too. Oh, Are you going to give us I think there was the whole show, the final answer. Are you going to give us a written um, worksheet so we can remember about these two? Oh, I, let me see if I can. If I can't, I'll give you paper and let you write it down and, and try to go slow enough because there's a lot in that. But maybe I can. I'll see if I can. Okay. Okay. And if so, I'll email it out to you all. And it may not come until the morning of class, so check your email in the morning of class. I keep trying to do better than that. But anyway, um, but keep the thoughts going. Keep the questions. And I will ask you, is that your final answer? <laughs> If you yes, saw that game show, you know what I mean. I'm going to close this real quick in prayer and then open it to any discussion also. We will pick it up really at verse 9 again, but it, um, we'll especially move forward with verse 10 with what, what you know, we have to think a lot about the blood and everything that, that's involved here. Because we've been talking about the blood of a sacrifice, now we're talking about the blood of a human. So, very interesting. And I love the questions, I love the thoughts, I love you running ahead of me. Don't ever feel bad when I tell you. I just have to make you wait to let me get everything out. <laughs> but I love it, okay? Lord God, thank you. Thank you for giving us minds to think, for asking us to use our minds. You have not made us puppets. You want us to think, and you want us to want to be on your team. You want to have you as master. And Lord, thank you that you are such a loving and a caring master, that you are in all essence not just a master, but a shepherd, the great shepherd, the chief shepherd, and each of those words meaning so much to us, Lord. We just thank you and we praise you, your love, your forgiveness, your grace, and your mercy. Hallelujah. As long as the day is, Lord, we will praise you and thank you. In the name of Yeshua, Jesus. Amen.